Okay, our next presenter is Christopher Blackwell from Furman University. We'll be speaking on the subject of philology, technology, collaboration, 16 years of the Homer multitext. Um, while I'm plugging in my computer, I'll say I think the tree banging set is awesome. And it's, I think it's going to be a really big deal in the 21st century. Um, I just love it to pieces. All right. Um, thank you all for being here um, to, to listen to us. And um, thank, you, thank you, Neil, very much for organizing this and for your uh, feedback, which made um, this talk better. Um, and what, uh, feedback is a euphemism for chastisement at various points when he, he read uh, my, my proposal um, and said, you know, this isn't really what you're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> so. Um, the Homer Multitext, the project I've been involved with, has been going on for 16 years, and so it did seem maybe appropriate to talk about the changes that it has seen, that we have seen, that we have benefited from, and that maybe in a couple of cases we've contributed to, for better or for worse, um, during this time. Um, the Homer Multitext, I'll begin very briefly by introducing it um, for those of you who, who haven't encountered it. It's a project um, of the Center for Atlantic Studies of Harvard University, Casey Douay and Mary Ebbett are the editors of it. Um, it really began in 2001 when Casey Douay, Mary Ebbett, Leonard Mulner, and Gregory Nagy um, began having conversations about what a 21st century edition of the Iliad would look like. Um, they did not want, they weren't seeking to recapture the original text of the Iliad because they don't believe in one. Um, but rather an edition that would uh, document um, the tradition of an evolving um, corpus of epic poetry and its manifestation as, as the Iliad over time. Um, for the past number of years, we've profited immensely by having the wonderful Stephanie Lindeberg as a project manager on this, and she's a tremendous scholar and a lovely person. Neil Smith and I are project architects, so we're the plumbers of the Homer multitext. Since 2007, the main work that we focused on has been editing the Venetus A, which is, um, that's it. It's a 10th century manuscript. It's the oldest complete text of the Iliad. And of course, it's lavishly annotated with the scolia, which are um, excerpts and paraphrases of otherwise lost um, Alexandrian and Roman um, scholarship that preserves all kinds of interesting information. The HMT has also been responsible for digitizing a number of other important primary um, source documents for the Iliad. Um, to date, we have 18,051 high-resolution digital images under Creative Commons licenses on a server in Houston, and you can get them all. Um, aim wget at it. Um, and I have to give a shout out to the lovely people at the University of Houston Center for High Performance Computing who provide us this space, which would cost like $60,000 a year otherwise. Um, as of January 1st of this year, we have completed um, 17 books of the Venetus A, 10,613 poetic lines, 5,704 scolia. It's about a quarter of a million words of Greek. So this is like the, the opposite of a Greg Crane talk, right? Greg Crane wants to get a billion words next week, and we've spent 16 years, and we have a quarter of a million words, right? <laughs> Um, but I think the, the have completed um, paraphrastic verb there is, uh, is, is what I want to talk about to explain why it took 16 years to do 10,000 poetic lines um, of Greek is one of the things I want to talk about. So a variety of changes during these 16 years. I mean, one change is a change away from the age of heroes. Um, Homeric scholarship, of course, is marked by these heroic figures who deserve their immortality. And like good heroes, they often throw spears at each other. Um, and this, I chose the image because I knew Greg was going to be here. This is your buddy, um, Wolf, on there, glaring at us um, <laughs> from there. We have a, a phalanx of hoplites. OK, this is how the Homer multitext um, rolls. I'm checking on GitHub. We have 154 editors registered and 38 teams. They're virtually all undergraduates. Um, from a variety of institutions in North America and Europe. Um, our students, 
I'm not going to say too much about this. Our students seem very happy. They do this in their spare time voluntarily for no pay or credit. Um, they keep coming back. They do it on Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, over in the recent years, we had five of our alumni at different institutions, as a direct result of this work, get Fulbright fellowships. So that's worth something. Um, it doesn't really make sense to talk about changes in our profession um, in the absence of changes in all other professions, especially ones that deal with information technology. Um, the Git, you know, collaborative version control systems, social coding, um, is the glue that binds all of this together. And it's kind of a two-way street that maybe we haven't exploited both directions of so much. We've, we're increasingly profiting in a way that classics has never done before from industry. And I think we maybe could do better about pushing that in the other direction, too, um, just off the top of my head. I want to, I'm out of time already. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to emphasize this is not crowdsourcing, OK, unless the Apollo missions were crowdsourced. Um, our editors are not mechanical Turks. They are Homeric scholars. If the ability to look at a page of a Byzantine manuscript and read every word of Homeric Greek and read all of the Byzantine scholarly Greek on it at a level of detail, unpacking the abbreviations. If that makes you a Homeric scholar, they are, um, because that's what they can do. Um, and it's a job for really close reading. Um, the change we've struggled with from the outset, and it's always temptation, it's always hard, is to avoid in our thinking and in our design of this project and the work, the instrumentalist fallacy, which is to confuse the tool with the job, right? The roofer's job is not use a hammer, right? The roofer's, jo roofer's job is to keep the rain and wind and squirrels out of the house. And um, this, I think, is always difficult for um, us humanists because our tool, the codex, you know, we've been using it for 1,500 years, and quite frankly, it was perfected 1,000 years ago with the Venetus Hay. <laughs> A manuscript, and really for the next thousand years, it was just a matter of breeding faster horses, right? It doesn't look fundamentally different in 1784 or in 1945. Um, and uh, getting out of that was relatively easy because we had examples like Perseus, which had already in the 1980s and 90s gone from hypercard, SGML to XML on the web and, and remained semantically intact. Um, already in 2001, before I was even invited to be a part of the project, um, Casey and Mary and, and Lenny and Greg knew that this will not just be a traditional printed edition that we managed to plaster behind the glass of your computer screen. Um, it, within a couple of years, we realized we're not making web pages. That's not the job here. Um, another kind of difficult thing for people who do computational humanities was realizing, oh, we're not doing XML either. That was hard, because XML is awesome, and TEI can do everything. It's like, no, that's not the job. That's another trap. So um, the people who did the linked ancient world data institutes, you have to give them a shout out. That changed my life and was instrumental in that. Currently, our HMT data happily moves in and out of different formats according to our different needs and um, doesn't lose any of its information. So we think we're doing that better. Change away from appeal to authority. This quotation. Of course, that is what textual criticism is about, rightness. This is from um, a quote from Martin West. This is from the, the Titanomachy of 2001 um, that uh, played out on the ringing plains of BMCR when um, Greg Nagy reviewed West's edition of the Iliad and West responded and the heavens thundered and <laughs> mountains were brought low. Um, and of course, West is absolutely correct um, I'm kind of on the Naj team, right? But West um, is absolutely correct here. He's a great scholar. And it's not just about textual criticism, right? It's about everything we do. Like, it, yeah, we want it to be right. We get paid to be right. You know, we're professional people who get stuff right, um, or try to. The question, of course, and what you can argue about, what responsible, serious scholars can argue about in good faith is what is right? And then you have to ask, is our work right? And then, how can we be sure? How can we prove it? And that's very hard. And I think it's taken us 16 years to um, begin to address some of these questions for our Homer multitext data. Um, the appeal to authority. 
These questions were even harder in the 20th century, and this wasn't anybody's fault. It was the inherent limitations of technology. The critical apparatus, which we all reveal, is a kind of hack and a compromise. Um, readers did not have access to manuscripts. You want to have some accountability. Um, you're limited by the physics and economics of the printed page. And the critical apparatus is lossy compression. And we spent a number of years before we had digital images working from critical ap apparatus and, uh, and found that out. And so to some extent, 20th century and earlier editions are inevitably, depending on the perceived authority of the editor, they can't be systematically checked. Well, our undergraduate editors don't have any authority. This has been made abundantly clear to me many times. I've heard this question three times in these exact words over the years. And I've never answered it because I don't believe it's a, a sincere uh, information-seeking question. Um, but I will be happy to say and proud to say that there is not one error in the Homer Multitext Archive, but 1,063 errors in the Homer Multitext Archive as of January 3rd of this year. Um, because we have worked very hard, and it's taken 16 years, to design the Homer Multitext so that we can enumerate categories of mistake and therefore enumerate and locate instances of mistakes and then hopefully fix them and have more rightness um, at the end of the day. This is a question of sustainability. It's another change in the discipline. In 2001, nobody was talking about sustainability um, in the sense that can our data sustain rigorous scholarly inquiry? Um, we're interested in multi-forms in, in the Iliad. These are really kind of nitpicky details, you know, Homeric language. Um, we need to be really precise and have some confidence that we know what's in our data, and so we have to test our data. Um, and so this is another change, ongoing change, like better ways to test our um, edition than simply by proofreading it, trying to proofread it. Um, the first thing we had to address is the naming of parts, um, how to name things. We can't test things unless we can name them, and I think the Homer Multitext has made a contribution in this area um, through our work on the CTS and site um, URN protocols, and these are concise, machine-actionable um, citations, uh, CTS for text, site URNs for everything else in the world um, that have, have proven useful in our project and, and other projects. Um, once we can name things, we can hope to test them. To test, you need a rubric, and in our case, we, that's a data model. And we like to think of data models as kind of Linnaean binomials, um, genus and species. We have generic ones and specific ones. Um, and once we have those, we can take our specific data models and implement them in technology and then implement tests for validation and verification of our students' data. And that's what gives us our 10,000, our 1,063 the errors. Very quickly, validation, as we use the term, is something a machine can do. Um, does this string parse as a, legitim a possibly legitimate Greek word or not? As a machine can tell you that according to some definition. Verification is something a human being has to do. Um, which Ajax is this? Um, or God help us, which Ptolemy is this? Right? Oh, it's Ptolemy the Ascalonite. Um, uh, a machine can't do that, but um, our, with writing software you can come up with um, tools that make it easier to do a better job of verification, I'll say. Um, our data models, um, I promise you, I'm not going into a lot of detail on these, but I'll be more than happy to bore you to tears with any of them um, for the rest of your life. Uh, but these are our data. We have a model for a digital scholarly edition, a, citable, a model of citable text, a model of textual edition, and a model of scholarly reading or analysis. Um, very quickly, a digital scholarly edition generically is a um, collection of graphs that have at least three vertices, um, interrelated text-bearing artifact, in our case a folio page, visual documentary evidence, picture of it, citable texts. And so here you can see kind of a implementation of a DSE model for folio 12 recto of the Venetus A. a citable text. Um, thanks to Neil Smith and Gabe Weaver, who is an undergraduate HMT editor, um, 
uh, citable text is an ordered hierarchy of citation objects. And this is the basis for CTS and the Canonical Text Services Protocol. We call it OCHO2. Um, textual edition. We've never talked about this in public before, so this is actually new. Um, our model of a textual edition is a citable text whose citation objects consist of an ordered sequence of semantically significant tokens. And that you're going to say, well, duh, <laughs> right? I'm like, yeah, it does. But you have to say it before you can start working with it, right? And even if it is a little obvious, there are, of course, no generic editions. Um, we can have a generic model of textual edition, but every edition is its own you know, special flower. Defining the text content of citation objects is what editors do, right? This is why Allen's edition is different from West's. Um, and um, we want to formalize this. So in our textual edition, specific textual edition model, so each of our tokens has these nine properties, some of which may have null values, and this lets us test what our editors work on. Um, and data model of scholarly reading, I'm not going to say anything about that. Monica Berti has an article, um, is the lead author on an article in the latest bulletin of the Institute of Classical Studies where she implements this for her work on Athenaeus, and it's a good article and you should read it. Um, all of this, I think, is simply trying to do a better job at achieving the same values that we've always had as philologists. And um, our friend Ross Scaife once said, the, the scribe of the Venice Day was trying to make a digital edition and, in fact, produce the best piece of information technology that that era could sustain. And that's, I think, all we're trying to do, do too. And, we're trying, and because we think it's cool, we're trying to get as many people as possible involved in it. Um, like I said, uh, Neil and I are the plumbers of the Homer multitext. Plumbing is not always that interesting, but it does contribute to a hygienic and happy house. Um, I've talked most, a lot about the kind of plumbing and theory behind plumbing here. Of course, the real stuff for the Homer Multitext, which I've completely ignored, is the work that the editors do, which is all available on GitHub, and the philological insights they've gotten from doing it, which um, you can get on the, on the project's blog um, and that. And so I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Yes? What's the state of CTS architecture uh, of citations? Is that covering you know, every text in the person's digital library at this point, or is it mainly Homer, or what, how much of that have we got? Well, well C CTS as a Protocol is generic and should apply to anything, and so. It, I it, want to say a passage from a author. Well, it, yeah, it, it would need to be available in a, in a CTS compliant thing, and so Greg is the guy to answer that about Perseus. And I do that here as his as his ripping board. It was for uh, his students. So many texts, you chapter, book chapter, you know, section. You have a built-in canonical text uh, or citation scheme. Uh, we don't accept, um, you know, Stephanus pages or Becker pages as really logical citations. So you have to go in and either recover somebody's, you know, chapters, uh, at, or add something yourself, chapters and sentences. It doesn't mean you can't keep the, the Becker and, and Stephanus pages as links, indexes in. Uh, and so one of the challenges is going through and finding a more logical citation scheme. Uh, ideally based on paragraphs or sentences, but lines of poetry of great syntax. But you can, but, but the Perseus texts are accessible and addressable by CTS URNs, I yes. think was this? Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and in the worst case, you have, you know, book, you know, it, the, uh, you know, book one, book two, book three, and then you index it by saying, get me the 312 pi. It's not really practical, but it works. Yes. So since 2000 or 2001, it seems like the technology has allowed you to come a lot closer to a representation of a multi-text. Do you see a difference in the way that the, that the students perceive the production of Homeric poetry as the, your ability to represent it the way you imagine it um, improves? That's, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really good question. Um, the technology has made 
the technology has certainly made it easier for the students to do more, better, faster. Um, in a lot of, in, in, in a lot of different different ways um, I mean you're actually I mean, I'm in danger of ask, answering the question I can answer instead of the one you asked because I don't know if I can answer answer that one um, on, honestly because uh, every group of students is, is different they, they find different insights I think because they can do more better faster they are getting and I think we've gotten better at being mentors and, and teachers um, I think in recent years, I, I have seen them getting a, a much enhanced sense of the tradition of, of scholarship, um, how the ancients worked and the, um, and the tradition of, of Homeric scholarship in print editions because we, as we work on this, we refer to those all the time and they're always very interested to say, to discover, working directly from the manuscript, discover the kind of hidden limitations of you know, serious, important, and fabulous works of scholarship like Allen's Editio Maior. I mean, that that's a great thing. It's li it was a middle twentieth century thing, and when they discover that Allen's app crit is like missing stuff that they know, because <laughs> they have read the Venetus A, like you know, from the back of the sheep. You know, they're um, they like that's that's exciting, and um, and and with with Erbsa too. I mean, they get a little bit smug because you know Arabs is it's like many volumes, this enormous thing, and to have even one moment when you can say like, "What I did is better than him," right? Even if it's like a tiny little thing, um, because there are like so many scolia that Arabs, because he was limited by his lifetime, you know, had to, he he skipped like some of the really big, long, cool ones um, because they didn't deal with um, variant readings, as he would say. We call them multiforms, um, and so in this. Um, and so they, they, they certainly get that. For example, the long scullion about Oedipus's second wife. Did you know? I didn't. <laughs> um, like, there's someone for everybody, right? Um, <laughs> but that, that is completely, you know, the students signed that, and it's hard, and, you know, they wanted to, like, go cheat and look at what Erbsa had, and it's like, first word, ellipsis, last word. It's like, nothing in here about the textual tradition, just a bunch of stuff about Oedipus. So, I still I think I cheated and didn't answer your question, but I said stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks.